persevered and went directly to the people because I don't need anyone's financial support, nor do I need anyone's approval as to what to say. I just had to do the right thing. I had to do it. I had no choice. I see what's happening to our country. It's going to hell. I had to do it. jobs because his whole economic program is geared for one thing and one thing alone to produce many many more jobs in the United States to to produce jobs that create good careers that produce jobs that take take your education and make your education worth what you had to put into it not just in terms of money but in terms of time and effort I know from talking to many people in your age group that their big concern like when they're in college is, uh, are there going to be jobs for us? And then I know from many that there aren't that many jobs, and they, there aren't particularly good jobs, and jobs that give you a future. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason why over the last eight years, America's jobs re really haven't grown, and why Americans are making less money now. Many of them are making less money now than they were eight years ago. And the reason is that we've been following the wrong economic policies. And he's going to put in place the right economic policies. He's going to put in place economic policies, first of all, that reduce taxes from 35% to 15% on businesses. Now you say, okay, well that's giving a break to businesses. Well, first of all, that's all businesses, big ones and small ones. And when you reduce taxes from 35% to 15%, you know what happens? A lot of those businesses that took your jobs away, that went to Europe or went to Mexico, or went to Asia, those jobs come back here to America. And they come back here into America.
just have a good time. I look forward to this. I'm getting tired of the 15, 20,000 people. Thank you. We wanted to do a beautiful, nice, small, tight room with young. Look at you people. Beautiful people. Beautiful people. Incredible future. And we're going to have jobs for you when you get out of college, okay? You don't have them right now. We had a very bad jobs report. We're going to have big, big jobs. We have lots of choice, okay? Love you. So I'm really happy to be back here. I love you, too. And I do like Columbus. We've had great success in Columbus and uh, great friendships. I have great friends from Columbus. I want to make sure that you request your absentee ballot. Now, how many people here are old enough to vote? Big group. Whoa! I'd say that's a pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty good. Now I'll work a little bit harder, okay? See, now that I have that. And remind your friends and family to do the same. We're now 26 days, think of it, 26 days away from the most important election of even your lifetimes. And you have a long life ahead of you, a long, long life. But our country is going wrong. And we have only just begun to fight. We're going to make this country so great again. If we win, will create a booming and thriving economy for young Americans and jobs for young Americans. To me, that's so important. We'll create safe communities, lower taxes, leaner government, affordable child care and health care, and a government that's honest and decent and fair. You don't have that now. We are going to be... <laughs> and so jaded already. But you understand life, I'm impressed. You understand life at a young age. We are the campaign of change, you know that. We will deliver jobs, opportunity, and justice for future generations, your generations. We will, better believe it. I've wanted this race, and you know that, to be about the issues. We won by everybody's account the other night. We had a debate with Crooked Hillary. And we won that debate. And, and I mean, I'm not saying that's what everybody's saying, and I felt that we won the debate. Remember when she walked in front of me, and I stood, and here's my podium, and here's my chair, and all, and I'm standing, and she walks right in front of me. And then the next day, she stood answering a question, right? And she was right here, and I was right here, never moved. And the next day, the paper came out and said, I invaded her space. I said, what? <laughs> what? I, I invaded her space. Now we won that one, and we look forward, I guess, Wednesday night, we have another one with Crooked Hillary. <laughs> and by the way, I don't know if you know, the big Wall Street Journal NBC poll just came out in Ohio. Oh, we're only one up. You know? No, you know what? And I say that kiddingly, we're one up. And uh, we got very unfairly battered by people I have no idea who these people are. I've been battered by people that I have no idea who they are. But we're one up in the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, which never treats me good. So we're one up in Ohio, and it just came out in North Carolina. We're one up also. We're doing well. And she spent. A fortune on ads, fortune, here in North Carolina, just an absolute fortune. Uh, and, you know, I'll tell you what, we're going to have some big surprises. This is going to be Brexit all over again, except even bigger numbers. <laughs> the Clinton campaign has refused to discuss the issues. In fact, the WikiLeaks just came out today. She's got no core. Her people are saying, what's her core? What's she talking about? What's her core? I have a core. You know what it is? Make America great again. That's my point. Instead, instead of the issues, they've slandered and libeled me with false accusations. But we will not let these lies distract us from our campaign. And it's a campaign of truth. It really is. In an earlier speech today, 
I address the fact that I was falsely accused, and I think possibly some of you have seen it or watched it. It's a disgraceful thing that you can be on the front page of the failing New York Times, and it is a failing newspaper. It's third-rate people, I'm telling you, third-rate bad people, bad people, sick people. I was on the front page. I think I had three stories on the front page today. Three. Who ever heard of three? Boom, boom, boom. I guess it sells newspapers, unfortunately, but don't worry, because the paper's going out of business. It's only a question of when. But it's the failing New York Times, and they're inventing false claims without any evidence, no witnesses, no nothing. An act that supposedly years and years ago, I never met these people. I don't even know who they are. They're made up stories, filed right before the election. Right before the election. I wonder if that had anything to do with this, right? <laughs> it's a disgrace. I really mean it's a disgrace. I want to talk about policies affecting our lives, but I did want to mention that we did spend some time talking about that today. It just came out, and the sad part is we don't talk about WikiLeaks because it's incredible, but WikiLeaks just came out with a lot of new ones. And it would be wonderful if these very dishonest people back there would talk about it. It would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. They don't want to talk about it because they want her in there because they perpetuate. But these are very, not all, but a big, big percentage. Very dishonest people. In fact, the reason I was late to the podium was because they weren't ready. We waited for them. And I said, let's go up without them. Who cares? But. But my people said, no, we should wait till the press is ready. So I'm sorry to keep you waiting, but it's their fault, not mine. <laughs> right now, our government has been taken hostage by global special interests that will stop at nothing to drain every last ounce of wealth from this country for their personal benefit. You're going to see it. The greatest weapon wielded by crooked Hillary is the media. That's what she got. She got nothing else. Believe me, there's nothing there. She couldn't even pass her bar examination in Washington, D.C., okay? I don't know if you know that, okay? Hillary Clinton failed her bar examination in Washington, D.C. She got nothing going. The WikiLeaks emails show that the Clintons and the corporate media are one and the same. They collaborate and they conspire together. This Washington establishment will stop at nothing to stop all of us. And you're going to see that. You're young people, but you're going to see that. Although we do have one of the most successful real estate people in the world. Would you please stand up? Look at this guy, 55,000 units. So stand up. Oh, great real estate man, actually. One of the best in the country. It's good. And from these parts. It's very good. I'm proud of you. These are the people who have given us decades of endless wars, producing only death and bloodshed, but no victory. What a victory. Can you imagine Douglas MacArthur? Can you imagine General Patton in their grave, right? Spinning. Look, he's going like this. Spinning. They can't believe it. We announced six weeks before, we're going to Mosul. Did you hear? We're going to Mosul in a few weeks, and we're going to attack them. Whatever happened to the old adage, like, you know, you sort of do it like, don't tell everybody. You do it, let's talk about the victory after. They go into Mosul, they want to go to Mosul to get the leaders of ISIS, because they say they're in Mosul. But they announce that they're going there for the last three weeks. So the leaders, you know, they're smart, they're left, they're gone. Oh, these people, we have some real beauties. Our president is incompetent, I will tell you that. He is grossly incompetent. These are the same people, although all he likes to do is campaign. Why isn't this guy working on jobs? He's campaigning all the time. He's campaigning or playing golf. He plays more golf than if you were on the PGA Tour. These are the same people who have flung our doors open for radical Islam, putting us on the same path to France and to multi-generational struggles with violence and extremism embedded in our communities. You see what's happening. Take a look at France. Take a look at Germany. Take a look at certain parts of Sweden. Take a look at areas 
You don't want to go there. These are the people who've allowed violent international cartels to invade our country and prey on our most vulnerable citizens. And they are vulnerable. Victims like Marilyn Ferris, raped by an illegal immigrant with a lengthy criminal record and beaten to death viciously with a hammer, wasn't supposed to be in our country. Should never have been. They didn't want to put them out. These are the people who have let our drugs pour, and let just drugs. Drugs are pouring into our country from the southern border. And they're poisoning our children. Hopefully, they're not poisoning you. Stay away from drugs, stay away from alcohol, and stay away from cigarettes. I, I always tell my kids, no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. Ivanka said to me when she's like five, she didn't even know what I was talking about. She said, Dad, you're driving me crazy with that. But every time they went, no drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. So you just remember that. Puts you at a big, big, big disadvantage. You get hooked. If you get hooked, it's hard to get unhooked. Puts you at a big disadvantage. So just remember, maybe that's the thing you'll learn or remember most from what I'm going to say, okay, if you want to know the truth at your age. These are the people who emptied the jobs out of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, and all of our states, so many of our states, and shipped them to Mexico and other countries. The political powers trying to stop us are the people who have stripped these jobs right out of our inner cities, trapped millions of African American and Hispanic Americans in impoverishment. I mean, it, they're impoverished. You have to see these inner cities, and you've seen them. You've seen them. They're crime besieged neighborhoods and left 70 million American women and children in poverty or near the brink of poverty. At the center of this assault on American prosperity is the Clinton campaign. These are her ideas. These are they, they want to do it. They've been running the inner cities, the Democrats, and the Democrat ideas for up to 100 years, and even more than that. Unbroken. Guess what? It's not working. And it's very unfair to the people that have to live there and be shot when they walk to the store and all of the things that you read about and watch every night on television. They don't work for you. They don't work for America. They work only for themselves. These are the people we're talking about, including foreign government and foreign actors. Hillary Clinton is a criminal who destroyed 33,000 emails after a congressional subpoena was issued. Can't do that. It's a criminal. She is a criminal. You get a subpoena from the United States Congress, and you say, get rid of those emails. 33,000 emails were deleted and acid washed. Nobody even heard of it. They were bleached. It's a very expensive process. People don't use it because it's too expensive. She used it. And then she hammered her phones, right? Anybody get rid of your cell phone? Anybody ever hammer it? Anybody hammer it? Anybody? No? Good. That means we have all honest people in here. <laughs> she ignored hundreds of requests for security in Benghazi, causing the death of four brave Americans. And then she lied to the face of grieving parents about the reason for the attack. You remember that. She defended a man who violently and viciously raped a 12-year-old girl by horribly smearing and blaming the victim. And then she laughed about getting the rapist off the hook. You've seen the tape. She was laughing. She thought it was funny. The guy raped a 12-year-old girl. Speaking in secret to a foreign bank, Hillary pledged her support for open borders. That means tens of millions of new foreign workers to compete against you for your jobs, your wages, your future. She's selling out the future of young Americans of all backgrounds to enrich her donors. We won't let that happen. We're not going to let it happen. Hillary and her special interest allies want to keep children in our inner cities trapped in failing schools. Under a Trump administration, disadvantaged children will be able to attend the public, private, charter, or magnet school of their choice. Under President Obama and Hillary Clinton, it's very important. And we'll also get rid of Common Core and bring education local. This is Under President Obama, 
on Hillary Clinton, the national debt has almost doubled. $20 trillion national debt is a weight around the future of every young person in this country and every young person, sadly, in this room. It would require $120,000 from every millennial in the country to pay it off. Anybody have $120,000? We'll make a good. How about 50? How about 20? How about two? We'll sell it to you for two. The new debt added under Obama and Clinton would have been enough to pay off all of the outstanding student loans in the United States six times over. Think of that. Yet, not one penny of that new debt has gone to lowering your tuition and the people that are going to follow you. It's only getting worse. Outrageous. He's right. <laughs> Who said that? Stand up. Stand up. That's OK. No, I'm not going to. No, that's OK. Good. Nice looking guy. Good. Sit down. <laughs> We made him a little nervous when I said stand up. He's a good guy. The share of 16 to 28-year-olds not in the labor force has increased to 45 percent during the Obama administration. Tremendously, tremendously bad things are happening. In the Trump administration, we will work every day to make America great again for everybody, including millennials. First. We will lower the cost of college and solve the student loan crisis. It's a crisis, very unfair. <laughs> the biggest crisis is you graduate, you do well from great colleges, like where we are right now, great colleges. But you graduate, you do well, you're proud of yourselves, your parents are proud of you, there are no jobs, there are no jobs, no good jobs. Tuition at public four-year institutions was 40 percent higher in the last school year than it was 10 years ago. In all, Americans owe $1.3 trillion in their student loans. Think of that, $1.3 trillion. More than auto loans, credit card debt, home equity. I mean, nationwide, you're talking about the biggest factor. Students should not be asked to pay more on their loans than they can afford. And the debt should not be an albatross around their necks for the rest of their lives. And that's what it is. We're going to work that out. We're going to work it out, folks. We're going to work it out. It'll be a negotiation. You know that. It, everything's a negotiation, but the art of the deal. We're going to work it out. We're going to work it out big league. But it's very unfair. You graduate. You know, you graduate from college, and you're starting with, like, a, an anchor around your neck. No good. It's no good. Not fair. That's why, under my student loan program, we would cap repayment for an affordable portion of a borrower's income 12.5 percent. We'll cap it. That gives you a lot to play with and a lot to do. And if borrowers work hard and make their full payments for 15 years, we'll let them get on with their lives. They just go ahead and they get on with their lives because it's very, very hard for young people. It's probably the question I get more than any other question outside of defense is, which is catastrophic, what's going on with our, you know, how, we, how badly we treat our, our veterans, how badly we treat our military folks. But I get asked so much about student loans and student debt. Young Americans deserve the same deal as federal workers. So we will equalize treatment so everyone can start saving for their families in retirement by the time they're 15 years out of college. So start counting, 15 years. In addition, I will take steps to push colleges to cut the skyrocketing cost of tuition. It's happening. It's happening. Very unfair. Because students are like a conduit. They get the money, they give it, they get, and there's not enough incentive for these colleges to cut. And the costs are going up mammothly, much more so than other businesses and industries. And I fully understand why. We're going to do something about it. If the federal government is going to subsidize student loans, it has a right to expect that colleges work hard to control cost and invest their resources in their students. If colleges refuse to take this responsibility seriously, they will be held accountable, including by reconsidering whether those with huge endowments deserve to keep those endowments tax-exempt. We have a lot of power over the colleges. 
and they're not doing the job of cost cutting because they don't have the incentive to cost cut because you're paying for it because you're paying for it some schools are paying more to hedge funds and private equity managers than they are in spending and this is true than they are spending on tuition and tuition assistance while taxpayers are guaranteeing hundreds of billions of dollars of student loans to pay for rising tuition costs we want universities to spend their endowment on their students, not themselves. We have to take care of our students. They need to use that money to cut the college debt, and they have to cut college tuition. They have to do it, and we have to do it quickly. Much of the skyrocketing cost of college education is due to the tremendous bloat in college administrators, and bureaucrats. I know that doesn't happen here, but you know, just maybe some places. It doesn't happen here, does it? No. No? <laughs> no, I'm sure it doesn't. But every place else it does. According to the Department of Education, the number of college administrators is up more than 60% since 1993, 10 times the increase in tenured faculty positions. Federal regulations are responsible for much of this administrative bloat, and it is bloat. Vanderbilt University estimated that it spends $150 million per year, 11% of the university's budgets, to comply with government regulations. Big problem. Regulations in this country, a big problem. And by the way, I'm cutting your taxes big league. Massive. <laughs> Hillary is increasing your taxes. So when you get out, and when you get those good jobs, you're also going to be paying, if I'm president, a lot less taxes. She's going to increase your taxes very substantially. As president, I will immediately take steps to drive down college costs by reducing the unnecessary cost of compliance with federal regulations so that colleges can pass on the savings to students in the form of lower tuition. I will also make it a priority to protect students' rights to free speech on campus. Do you want free speech? Does everybody want You'll have it. Wow. Wow. You like that more than the lower cost. I mean, that's impressive, right? What's going on? That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You know why? He just said it. You know why? Because what? Say it again. That's a pretty great statement. Pretty good. Hey. Do you want to be my speechwriter? I think that would be good. It's very, that's very good. That's very, very good. That's true. We love America. We want our country to be healthy again. We want to make America great again. That's been our whole theme, and we want to do that. But that's really well said, I want to tell you. Stand up. Let me see you. Wow. Good. What is that you're wearing? Turn around. Show the press. They won't cover it if it's negative on Hillary. That's great. That's great. Thank you very much. Great. Good. Great future. In the past few decades, political correctness — oh, what a terrible term — has transformed our institutions of higher education from ones that fostered spirited debate to a place of extreme censorship where students are silenced for the smallest of things. You say a word somewhat differently, and all of a sudden you're criticized, sometimes viciously, we will end the political correctness and force a free and respectful dialogue. We also have to recognize that traditional four-year degrees and programs are not the only path to a good job and a good career. We understand that. We will fully support schools that allow people to learn skills and practice a trade so young people can have access to the education that's right for them. I, for instance, in going when I was in school, we had some students that were horrible students. But man, could they fix an engine of a car or they could fix things that were so much better than anybody else. They had a great ability for mechanics, for machinery, for operating bulldozers. For, I mean, a much greater ability than 
others that had straight A's in physics and math and all of the other subjects that we all take. And we forget that. It's very important. It's a great talent. It's a great skill. And we must hold all schools equally accountable for their performance. I will make sure that students have the information they need all about their options. They have to have options before starting school and for repaying their student loans upon leaving school and we'll make it so you can do it and do it very easily. You watch. There's a lot of room for improvement in this regard. Currently, students navigate 16 complex repayment plans. You know about that, right? Some of you. Eight forgiveness programs and 32 deferment and forbearance options. Each of these programs has their own nuances and qualifications. I will simplify this confusing maze into a single income-based repayment program similar to those that have proved so popular in recent years. That's a very important thing. Very important. We also have to make sure that those who have graduated college and those who are soon to graduate can find a great job. This good job, but I mean great job, right? We want great jobs. We don't want good jobs. To start a career when they do, a lot of our great jobs are gone. Gone to other countries, gone to Mexico, gone to China, gone to lots of places. We don't have many good jobs anymore. Many mothers across this country are worried their kids won't find jobs. Are any of your mothers worried about that? Huh? Yeah. No, a lot of mothers and fathers. Yeah, no, and fathers. And they're right to be worried. One of the biggest threats is outstanding and out, it's really a, a tremendous, it's a tremendous threat. The outsourcing of jobs for college-educated kids are being sent to other countries, and they're going at a, at a rate that we've never seen before. At the same time, companies are importing low-wage workers on H-1B visas to take jobs from young, college-trained Americans. You've been seeing that, and you've been hearing that. We'll protect these jobs for all Americans, believe me. My economic plan, including tax, trade regulatory, and energy reforms, will create 25 million new jobs and allow the private sector to grow at 4% per year. Right now, it's hardly growing at all. Crooked Hillary Clinton is going to increase taxes incredibly, incredibly, unbelievably, a tremendous amount, while we cut taxes massively. Tremendous difference. Our plan includes reforms to protect and expand the sharing economy. Startups like Uber that have managed to provide great services for consumers and to consumers, in some cases, in some cases I'm hearing little other things. We'll have to check that out. Do you like Uber? Does everybody like it? Okay and create lots of jobs in the process. Finally, and most importantly, the foundation for a new prosperity will be rededication to the constitutional rule of law. A vote for me is a vote for change, and a vote for me is really a vote for you. Together, we will make America so strong we will make America so powerful and so rich. Together, we will make America great again. And I want to thank you, and God bless you. You are amazing young people. Amazing young people. Keep up the good work. Say hello to your parents, okay? And thank you, fellas. Thank you. Thank you.